Hey, Chris. Yes, Chris. What is the secret to a good joke? I don't know. What is the secret Timing. to a good joke? Oh. <laughs> have you ever had this happen to you on Facebook? Someone posts something and you have a witty comeback already. So you fire up your fingers, type it out, post it, and zing! Your joke is first, you win! All the karma shall be yours! Then you reload, and you notice that your evil nemesis has posted the same joke, and it showed up before you. Now you look stupid. You copied his joke. At this point, you might wonder, what happened? How did Facebook decide to put his answer before yours? And why didn't it warn you? Surely there are rules which govern who gets to be wittiest. If we're to understand these rules, we need to understand the problem. It takes time to type a witty response. It also took time for your nemesis to do so. Both of you were typing at the same time, in parallel. Real conversations don't work that way. When one person speaks, the other people listen. Facebook is happy to let you type in parallel, and then it uses rules to sort out the consistency problem later. Why? Well, it's because people type slowly, and it's faster to let everyone type at once. Also, it's easier to implement, since allowing only one person to type at a time would be a usability and failure handling nightmare. Distributed systems have this kind of problem all the time. And so to talk about this problem, we need some new words. The rules for what we allow to happen in parallel, and how we merge the results when more than one thing is changing, are called a consistency model. We really need consistency models since they allow a distributed system designer to explain to the engineers who are using it exactly how difficult their life will be. Once you know what they are, you see consistency models used all over the place. Messaging apps, be it Facebook or Twitter or SMS or iMessage or just the start. They are used to make Git work. Distributed file systems rely on them. A lot of early development on consistency models came from trying to make and improve multiprocessor computers. So, as a result, a lot of the terminology we use is drawn from multiprocessor cache coherence. I studied this in grad school, so hopefully I can explain it well here. So let's dive in. I'll start with the strict consistency model and gradually relax the constraints that made this model so strict. Back when I wrote my first parallel program, it was using user space threads on Linux. My computer only had one CPU. It ran the multiple threads by context switching. It would run for one thread on the CPU for a bit, and then switch to another one, and so on. So when a thread performed a read or write, it always saw the memory system just as the last thread to run left it. There was no question. When a thread wrote to memory, the data was written was instantly visible to all the other threads. This is the strict consistency model. All writes are instantly visible to all subsequent reads. Let's look at an example. Here we have a program with three threads, which read and write the variables a and b. a and b are initially zero and are used to synchronize between the threads. When the execution starts on a strictly consistent system, only one thread can read or write memory at a time. So let's say it's thread two, which sees that a is zero, and it continues to spin in an infinite loop. Once thread one gets to run, it writes one to a, and now the new value is instantly visible to the other two threads. Thread 2 can now exit the loop, and it writes 1 to b. Since b is now 1, the third thread can continue on to the assert statement, which passes because, of course, a equals 1. As an aside, when we have an example like this, we need to be careful about our assumptions. I'm assuming that each read and write of a variable here is atomic, or indivisible as far as the consistency model is concerned, and we can't just context switch between halfway through writing a variable and see a partially done state on another thread. Um, instead, it just either has written or it hasn't written when we context switch. In addition, if we wrote this code in C and ran it through a modern optimized compiler, we might get hosed by the optimizer. For example, the generated code might not read the value of A from memory every time through the loop, because the optimizer decided that wasn't needed. And the loop might entirely be optimized away since the compiler might decide it actually doesn't do anything. So what we need to do is we need to add annotations in the compiler, such as using the volatile keyboard or whatever is appropriate, in order to stop the optimizer from generating code which doesn't do what we want. When you're learning about the consistency model used by a system, you can also find yourself worrying about details like this as well. If we were to formalize this strict consistency model, we could say that we have a series of processes that run in parallel. But to access memory, they have to communicate through a switch, which can randomly move to service any process. 
perhaps moving on demand. The switch guarantees that only one memory operation, a read or a write, is done at a time. This makes it easy for you to reason about what your program is doing. But since no two memory operations can run at the same time, your program will be slow, especially if you have a bunch of processes running. To implement strict consistency in a distributed system, you have to implement the centralized switch somehow. And the overhead of communicating with the switch for every read and write operation would be awful. Therefore, strict consistency is rarely actually used in distributed systems. Instead, we use something that is slightly more relaxed, called sequential consistency. With sequential consistency, we assume that each process doesn't care about the reads of other processes. All it cares about are the writes done by other processes. With that assumption, we can have each process have its own private copy or cache of all of memory, or at least of the things that it's using. So now each process can run in parallel and keep on running as long as it doesn't need to communicate a write to other processes. So in this example, the two while loops just keep on spinning, repeatedly reading the values of A and B from their caches, seeing that they have not changed and going around the loop again. When a write is performed, we need to do more work. The write to A gets put into a write queue. When the write reaches the head of the queue, it is broadcast to every cache that has a copy of the written value. Those caches then update their value for A, and now A equals one for everyone. The update to process one's cache lets the process know that the write is completed and it continues running. Process two can now exit the while loop and writes to B. When that write reaches the head of the queue, the same thing happens again and process three exits the while loop. Once again, our assert passes since the new value of A has been communicated to process three. Success! Our code still works, even though we are allowing our processes to actually run in parallel. Sequential consistency is powerful, and we can, and have, build actual parallel computers which implement this model. So this is sequential consistency. How do we formally define this? Well, with a sequentially consistent execution, we can write down all the writes that were done in a log, based on when they reached the head of our queue. The reads we can then just add to this log in between the writes. Since they are not communicated between processes, the interleaving order of reads is not that important, as long as we can come up with some order that is equivalent to the original execution. We can easily construct this log and prove that it is equivalent to some sequential ordering of the reads and writes that the program does. Since we can do this, we say that the execution is sequentially consistent. Every single process acts as if it reads and writes happened in the same sequential order. If you study databases, this concept may seem familiar to you. It's called serializability in that world. But here we're calling it sequential consistency. So where would we use sequential consistency? Well, it's quite popular model for multiprocessor computers with a small number of CPUs, where every single write can be broadcast over a shared bus that just spans the entire machine. Since only one CPU can send a message on the bus at a time, the bus acts as a shared write queue and enforces the ordering of writes, makes sure only one's happening at a time. Sequential consistency is also frequently used when your distributed system has a controller process for some shared data. It's simple and it's easy to use, and it performs rather well if you're reading shared data much more frequently than you're writing to it. Sequential consistency lets our system go way faster than strict consistency, since our read operations can run in parallel. But what if we really want our write operations to run in parallel too? What if we relax the requirement that writes have a global ordering that all processes agree to? FIFO consistency replaces this global ordering with a local ordering. FIFO consistency is also known as PRAM or pipeline rammed consistency, but we'll just call it FIFO here. But what does FIFO mean? Well, let's dive into an example. Here, once again, we have three processes. I've added a second assignment to A in process one and tweaked the assert to check if A is greater than zero, just to make this example go easier. Each process still has its own local cache of the variables, but communication now uses point-to-point -point links instead of the broadcast like we used in sequential consistency. So our processes can now all start running. The while loops spin away without communicating with the other processes because they just keep on reading from the cache. And when process one writes to A, it generates a message to every other process with a copy of A saying, this is the new value right here. Then the next write generates a second message. 
And it's important to note that these messages are received in the order they are sent. This in-order property is why we call this FIFO. It's first in, first out. When the change to A arrives at process 2, process 2 applies the change and then it exits the while loop and writes to B. This generates another message sent to the other two processes. Process 3 then applies the change to B and goes on to the assert statement, which fails. Wait, why didn't process 3 apply the change to A first? In the FIFO model, there's nothing that makes this happen. Updates from a single process get applied in order, but there's no guaranteed ordering for updates from different processes. So given how our program is written, it won't work correctly on a system that implements FIFO consistency. But since we are using FIFO consistency, it will get this wrong answer faster. Well, okay, fine. How do we fix this? We need to pay the programmer more to understand what is going on and insert extra code. Perhaps they could add a second while loop like this, which checks for A changing. With that in place, the assert will succeed. So if we build a system with FIFO consistency, we can scale it up further. We don't have a central write queue, which might act as a bottleneck that's like se sequential consistency has. The downside is that we need to be more careful when we program the system, as our writes might arrive in different order on different processes. A FIFO system might also require more messages, since point-to-point -point messages scale with n squared instead of order n like with our broadcast messages. This can be reduced by tracking where your data is cached and only sending updates to processes with stale data in their cache. You could also reduce it by using some multicast techniques so that you don't have to send as many messages. If you, maybe you send your messages on a tree or something like that. Let's talk about release consistency. With FIFO consistency, we can scale better than sequential consistency. But it still requires sending a lot of messages between the processes, one for every write that's done. Can we reduce this? In our examples above, we were implementing our own concurrency control primitives. But most people don't do that. They use ones that already exist, such as locks, semaphores, or condition variables. You just use what your language or library provides you. For our example, if all we had available was locks, we could instrument the program like this. Every time we access A or B, we make sure that we are holding the lock, L sub A or L sub B. While we hold the lock, no other process can read or write the locked data. Release consistency takes advantage of this fact. While we are executing code which doesn't acquire release locks, we know that there is no need to communicate between the processes. So we don't. When we release a lock with an unlock statement, we send messages saying what changed. When we acquire a lock with a lock statement, we wait until all inbound messages have been processed. By doing this, we decrease the number of messages between processes and also allow code which doesn't communicate, and hence doesn't use locks, to run without generating messages. The cost is we need to send messages about the locks themselves, but hopefully this is much less traffic than was needed to communicate every single write. So let's see how this works. Processes 2 and 3 can simply spin in their while loops, acquiring and releasing locks for A and B and seeing that nothing's changed. When process 1 acquires the lock, updates A, and then releases it, a message is generated with a new value for A. When this is received, process 2 can update B, which generates a message that process 3 consumes and exits its loop. At this point, you might worry that the assert is just going to fail, just like it did with FIFO consistency. But before the assert runs, we need to acquire the lock, which means we need to process all of the inbound changes to A. So by the time we run our assert statement, A is bigger than zero. Great! In fact, if we happen to have a system which supports FIFO consistency, using locks properly like we've done here is the only way of avoiding any issues caused by a relaxed consistency model. So to review, in release consistency, the programmer must use synchronization primitives. The system classifies all of these primitives as either an acquire or a release operation. It only communicates changed values between the release and acquire pairs, and it ignores all the other rights in terms of communicating. You'll find that variations on release consistency are used in modern multiprocessor CPU designs. To properly implement synchronization on these systems, you need to use special instructions such as atomic operations or fence operations. Another place you might see this is in a file system like Dropbox or Google Drive. When you change a file, the changes are not uploaded until you close the file. 
When you open a file, a new copy is downloaded if your cache is stale. So you might think of these systems as implementing a variant of release consistency, where the close operation is a release and the open operation is an acquire. So let's talk about eventual consistency. So far, we've had sequential consistency, where everyone sees the same global order of rights. FIFO, or param consistency, where everyone sees the same order of rights from each process, but they may interleave differently on each node. And release consistency, which lets those rights be sent only when synchronization primitives are used correctly. But what if we don't care about ordering of rights at all? We just care that eventually we get our data. In that case, we can build a much more efficient system. Eventual consistency is about as relaxed as things get and says that if everyone stops performing writes, then eventually everyone will see the latest version of each object. This model is used extensively in distributed systems because it is simple to implement and fast. Note, it's really easy to get it wrong. So your system has to be eventually converged to really be called eventually consistent. Sadly, this throws away many of the benefits of consistent systems. In a busy system, you may never achieve consistency. Using eventual consistency makes life harder for both developers and users, but this is a trade-off for performance that you may be willing to make. In spite of these caveats, it's worth realizing that if you quiesce an eventually consistent system or stop accepting new writes, it will converge on a single state in finite time. This is what differentiates it from an inconsistent system, or as I like to call it, a useless system. All right, how do we explain eventual consistency in a more intuitive way? A Twitter user named Greg Young points to the Invincible comic strip. This comic strip does a great job in illustrating a problem with eventually consistent programs. Things may get weird, but the weirdness tends to go away after a while. Outside of comics, you can see the effects of eventual consistency when using comment threads and things like Facebook. Now, I don't know how Facebook is implemented, but let's pretend it works like this. They have a server which contains a record per post. In this case, both myself and Bill Gates are reading this post by Linus at the same time, and we both come up with our hilarious answer. When we hit enter, the JavaScript in our browser makes our comment visible to us right away. That way, we don't know our comment was lost, and the UI makes it obvious we can no longer edit it. In the background, our comment is sent to the server. Right now, the view that Bill and I have is inconsistent. It doesn't matter who typed their comment first. The server just accepts comments when they come in. The server gets the comments, puts them in an arbitrary order with Bill first, and sends an update out to the web clients currently viewing the post. Bill wins, and I look like I lamely copied him with my joke. <sighs> Note that Bill and I might have been even been talking to different servers and it might have taken time for those servers to merge their diffs and come up with a consistent comment ordering. If one of those servers crashed and came back later, it might take an arbitrarily long period of time. But eventually, everyone sees the same view of the comment thread. As you can see, eventual consistency is weird. So weird that it's often used for data which will only be consumed by humans, since humans can tolerate this inconsistency and fix things up in their head when things go weird. Stricter consistency models tend to get used when data is used by a computer program. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of consistency models, ranging from strict consistency to some very relaxed consistency models. When building a distributed system, it's important that you understand what consistency model you are using so your system works correctly. Hopefully this video gives you an understanding of the basics so you know what to look out for and what to look for when you're building your own distributed systems. Thanks for watching.